I was speaking in Hebrew a little yeah. bit about the cell students, and then uh, it will be a lecture in English. אז אני מתרגש כי סיימנו שנה של התא ועשינו הרבה דברים שלפעמים נראים טיפה קטנים לפעמים זה נראה כאילו כל פעולה קטנה שאנחנו עושים חלוקה בגלל שאתה פה וכרזה פה והרצאה קטנה ולפעמים אין מספיק אנשים ואין מספיק קוררות וזה נראה לנו כאילו עושים דברים משמעותיים אבל הדברים האלה אני מקבל פרקים באמת מרצים שמתביישים ואומרים ושולחים לי הודעות תודה שאתם מייצגים את הדעה שלנו, סטודנטים שבאמת מרגישים חוץ מאיתנו ובכלל, חברי סגל ואפילו אנשים מהקפיטריות שבאים ואומרים אנחנו צריכים אתכם, שתשמעו את הכל שלנו ובגלל זה חשוב לי להגיד שגם הפעולות הקטנות הללו של לקלוט כרזה של מה בחרת, שזה נראה כמו איזה משהו שהוא לא בהכרח משמעותי זה נראה משהו כזה שטוב, תעלינו, אחרי יומיים תלשו לנו את זה כי פה אוהבים חופש ביטוי באוניברסיטה ואז אנחנו אומרים, טוב, אז למה? למה אנחנו עושים את זה שוב ושוב? ובאמת אני אומר, ההשפעה של זה, גם על הסגל, גם על האוניברסיטה, גם על הרבה מאוד גורמים, היא חשובה. אז רק אני רוצה לציין לך בקטנה דברים שעשינו השנה, כי ככה אנחנו שוכחים, וזה דברים חשובים. אז קודם כל אנחנו עוקבים אחרי כל פוסט או דברים שהאוניברסיטה עושה, ומיילים ודברים כאלה, ולמשל בתחילת שנה, כשהם אמרו פיצוצים במקום פיגועים, בטח אתם זוכרים את זה. וישר כשאנחנו מקימים צעקה על דבר כזה, אז הם מתיישרים, כי בואו, זה לא טעות תמימה, בסדר? הם יכולים להגיד את העיר וזה, אבל בסוף יש פה יד מכוונת מאחורי הכל, ואנחנו צריכים להיות שם. אנחנו צריכים, זה גם אם אנחנו לא מספיק אנשים, וגם אם אין באמת תנועה ענקית, ורוב הסטודנטים פה אפילו לא יצעקו על דבר כזה, צריכים שיהיה תא של אם תרצו, שיבואו ויגידו את הדברים האלה ויחד. חילקנו דגלי ישראל. כמובן זה היה מאוד חשוב, כי אתם יודעים מה קרה פה לפני בערך חודש, שתולשים פה דגלי ישראל, פשוט מגיעים ערבים ממזרח ירושלים, פשוט תולשים פה דגלים של יהודים שמסתובבים בעיר הבירה שלנו, שזה באמת דבר בלתי נתפס. כמובן, תחילת שנה הייתה את ההרצאה של מוחמד כעביה, לא יודע מי היה פה ומי לא, אבל גם היה מאוד מאוד מוצלח. היה מוחמד, אנחנו מאוד אוהבים ערבים ישראלים שבאמת מרגישים חלק, זאת אומרת... אנחנו, יש כל מיני טענות על גזענות, כל מיני דיבורים כאלה, אם תרצו, פשיזם, גזענות, זה דבר אבסורדי, כי אנחנו הכי מחבקים והאחים שלנו זה פשוט ערבים שנלחמים איתנו כתף וכתף. בקיצור, עשינו uh, הרבה דברים השנה, ואני מצפה שנעשה את הדברים הללו גם uh, שנה הבאה. אני נשאר פה, לא יודע כמה אני כן משנה, אבל בעזרת uh, השם אנחנו נגדל ונתחזק. ורק אני רוצה לסיים ש... זה נראה שהפעולות האלה קטנות, ולפעמים אפילו ילדותיות. זאת אומרת, יש איזה, תמיד איזה משהו קטן כזה בראש שאומר, לתלות עכשיו שלט זה ילדותי טיפה וזה לא אפקטיבי. אז מאוד חשוב לי להגיד שזה דברים שעושים אפקט מדהים על המון המון אנשים. במיוחד על השני תלו עכשיו משהו כמו פרוסות של נתנית. כן, ובמיוחד כשיש לנו אופוזיציה, כשיש לנו אופוזיציה לוחמת פה, אנחנו מכירים את זה, במחאת הסטודנטים, ותאי בל"ד, ותאי עומדים ביחד. והקול שלנו חשוב, צריך להמשיך להשמיע אותו. אוקיי, אני את שאני סיימתי, שי, אתה רוצה שנייה לדבר? כן. אז אני באמת שמח שכולכם הגעתם. קודם כל, אני רוצה ב... אולי נגיד את זה, נעשה את המחיאות כפיים בסוף, אבל אני כן רוצה להגיד תודה רבה גם לביתר וגם לתאיר ש... גם ארגנו את הערב הזה וגם על כל הפעילות השנה, גם לכולכם. כמו שביתר אמר, הדברים האלה באמת נראים לנו קצת אה, אה, קטנים ואולי אה, אה, חסרי השפעה או בעלי השפעה, השפעה קטנה לאורך הדרך, אבל ככה זה כשמסתכלים צעד צעד. גם כשעושים מסע ארוך, אתם יודעים, אנחנו מסתכלים כל פעם, עשינו צעד אחד, צעד שני, צעד שלישי, כל פעם זה נראה לנו צעד קטן, אבל לפעמים כשאנחנו מסתכלים מאחור ואנחנו מפנים את המבט, אנחנו רואים שעשינו מסע מאוד ארוך ביחד, וככה אנחנו רואים את זה גם ב... במהלך השנה האחרונה. הבאנו עכשיו, אני אגיד בעברית קודם, כי זה קצת יהיה לו יותר קל, אבל אז אני אגיד גם באנגלית, שכן כאן הוא ידיד מאוד גדול של תנועת אם תרצו, מגיע מארצות הברית כל הדרך, פעם בשנה מגיע, הוא הקדיש את השנים האחרונות בחייו להתעסקות עם כל מה שקשור לטקטיקות של ארגוני שמאל פרוגרסיביים בארצות הברית ובעולם בכלל. גם בהקשר במדינת ישראל, הטקטיקות פעולה שלהם נגד כל מה שנחשב לאומי ושמרני בעולם ונגד כל הזהות שלנו כלאומים שונים, בין היתר לאום יהודי בארץ ישראל. את הדבר הזה הוא חקר במשך שנים ארוכות, הוא ייתן לכם קצת ממשנתו, 
ואנחנו חושבים שזה מאוד יפה ומאוד ראוי לבוא ולסיים טיפה עם, ה... עם המקרו הזה, דווקא ביום כזה שאנחנו שומעים על זה שנתניהו הולך לבקר בסין במקום בארצות הברית, קצת יחסים בינלאומיים ולהיכנס ל... ל... או יותר נכון לצאת זום אאוט לתוך המקרו הזה. Um, so can I will uh, go on to English, uh, like I said earlier, uh, Ken Abramovich is a dear friend of mine, dear friend of Im Tirtzu, dear friend of our uh, uh, chairman of the board uh, of Im Tirtzu, uh, Douglas Saltabef, and also our CEO Matan Peleg. He dedicated his last years uh, to, uh, I think, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to, to explore uh, the method, the systematic way of the leftist All over, the, all over the world uh, to harm uh, national countries uh, uh, and the way of life in the West uh, in the last decade. Uh, he had uh, big uh, research about those kind of things and he has uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, inciting... Uh, uh, sorry, insightful. what? Insightful. Insightful, sorry. Insightful things uh, to... Uh, Uh, to teach us uh, about their way of thinking. Uh, he, have, uh, he has a very unique uh, way to describe them. Uh, he called them, he them uh, uh, now I'm doing a, a little bit of spoiler, he calling them uh, the reds, the blues, the greens, uh, uh, the whites, yeah, and now uh, he will show you uh, all, of the, all of those groups. Uh, first time I uh, heard about it was uh, was last year and it, since then it made me uh, understand a lot about you know the, how, how things are uh, organized uh, in our uh, mo post-modern world. Uh, so Ken, thank you so much uh, for being here <coughs> and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much Shai. It's great to see everybody here today. So we're going to have some fun, and we're going to discuss two simple issues, uh, good and evil. Good and evil. Are, are all of you here good? Yeah, like to think so. I'm trying to. Right. So what, what is the definition of good, and what is the definition of evil? I would say moral and immoral. Uh, yes. There's... <laughs> There's the, anyone else want to say what, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you my two definitions of uh, good and evil, but uh, anyone else want to say some things of what, what makes uh, a person or an institution or uh, a country or people or uh, organization, what makes them good and what makes them evil? Makes the evil it's easy because it's mostly connected to harm, to harm people or harm things. So this is the evil, but the good is the question. So I, I will give you two definitions of good, <coughs> which are interrelated with two definitions of evil. <coughs> so one definition of a uh, simple definition is the uh, Ten Commandments. So if someone says, I believe in all the Ten Commandments, I would say <coughs> that you're good. I mean, if you actually d do it, then not just say it, you, you actually do it. Now, <coughs> if you want to make someone evil in 10 seconds, Look at the Ten Commandments, take one word out of each of the Ten Commandments, and in 10 seconds you become evil, right? So, thou shalt not murder. You take the word not, you throw it away. Thou shalt murder if you feel like it. So, it's very easy <coughs> to convert someone from good to evil in 10 words in 10 seconds. Now, I'll give you a second definition for good and evil. In our Declaration of Independence in America, have, did anyone read the Declaration of Independence in America? Some of it. No. So in America, there's three great documents. The Constitution. We, we actually have a Constitution. We have a Bill of Rights. And we have the Declaration of Independence. So, uh, now you have a Declaration of Independence. You have a basic laws. And the basic laws include some of our Constitution and some of our Bill of Rights. You sort of put them together. So, in our Declaration of Independence, there's a very famous line, 
sentence in America. It's not so famous here. And you should bear in mind that the founding fathers of America were Christians, obviously, but they today would be called evangelicals. In other words, they understood the what they would have called the Old Testament or the Bible we call Torah, and they understood the New Testament and they put the two together. So our Constitution was founded based on Torah, which is ironic because America is a 90% Christian country, Israel is an 80% Jewish country, and in our Constitution there's more connection to the Torah than, than, the, than you have in Israel. So, um, just to spend one uh, minute on um, judicial reform. In the Torah, when Yitro is talking to Moshe Rabbeinu, he says to Moshe, you pick the judges. He did, Yitro did not say, go find 15 judges and let them pick the 16th and the 17th and 18th. No, he said to Moshe, you pick the judges and pick judges that are not corrupt. And number three, you handle the major cases and let the other judges handle the minor cases. The current judicial system rejects Yitro's all three suggestions. Pretty sad situation. Whereas in America, the founding fathers took Yitro's suggestions and in Israel, you ignored them. So that's a just an aside. So, there's a famous sentence. Okay. About the third point, that uh, Moses should uh, judge uh, higher cases. How does that come to a... Uh... Well, it, you can go directly to the Supreme Court. If you have a complaint, you do not have to go to the lower court, uh, what we call the appeals court, and then the Supreme Court can take five or ten years. You can go directly to the Supreme Court. That's, that, that's not what Yitro said. He said, the, the minor cases go to the regular judges. You, because uh, in effect, uh, uh, Moshe was, was in effect the Supreme Court too. He was, he was the prime minister and Supreme Court at the same time. But he said to him, you handle the major cases because you will exhaust yourself and exhaust the people who are waiting to talk to you every day without air conditioning, right? <laughs> no air conditioning, uh, 3,350 years ago. So there's a famous sentence that the role of the government is to defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone remember that? Life, liberty, and pursuit. Not happiness, the, the pursuit, the uh, desire for happiness. In other words, uh, a society cannot make you happy, but you have the right to make yourself happy, uh, work and study and whatever, makes people happy. So, With all this truth to be self-evident. Yes, that's right. So I, I just add uh, f just a few words that's not in the Declaration of Independence. So my definition of good is anyone who believes in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and I'm adding now, for 100% of the population. 100% of the population. Evil, the forces of evil, believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the population. Me, my family, and my friends, but not you. So those are my two definitions of good and evil. So um, in general, in America, the Republicans, or in Israel, Likud and its coalition, in America, as you know, we only have two parties, so you only have two flavors, so to speak. <laughs> so Republicans believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the population. Democrats believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the population. So why did the Democrats get 50% of the vote if they only care about 10% of the people? Well, Republicans, this is in theory, Republicans tell the truth 100% of the time. Democrats lie 100% of the time. Now you have the same situation here. Likud and its related coalition, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm talking in theory, I tell the truth 100% of the time, and the opposition lies 100% of the time. Now why does the opposition in Israel 
and the uh, well, it used to be the opposition, now the ruling party in America, why do they lie 100% of the time? Why are they evil? Well, they have to lie 100% of the time because when you're evil, you have no choice but to lie. Because if you told the truth, if you said, vote for me, I believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the people, me, my family, and my friends, no, not you, but I want you to vote for me and contribute money to my campaign so that I can take the money and then steal it so that me, my family, and my friends can live happily ever after, as we say in America. How many of anyone want to vote for me? No. So no one will vote for me, so they have no choice but to lie. Same thing. So Israel and America, every democracy has the same issue that you have one group of parties that are good, I'm not saying perfect, but let's just say good, and, a, and another group of parties that are evil. So every democracy is fighting good versus evil internally. But we're also fighting good versus evil externally. So there's a double war going on, and I call it World War III. We're all in World War III right now. And, um, and it's different from World War I and World War II. World War I and World War II were fought over there. World War III is primarily fought here, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in America, in France, or whatever country <laughs> that we live in. And I'm going to show you that World War III is actually World War I. But someone already numbered World War I and World War II, so I have no choice but to call World War III World War III, but I'm going to show you why it's World War I. Now, before, and I have a, a handout for all of you, but before I do, I just want to spend one minute um, acquainting you with, with me. So, I am uh, a professional student, and by the way, you, you do not know it, but you will be students for the rest of your life. You think you're just students for three years or, or whatever program you're in. Uh, you're students forever. You will constantly be teaching yourself. Now you might spend five days a week teaching yourself. Uh, in the future, after you think you're no longer a student, you're, you're going to have to spend one day a week teaching yourself about your job, and, uh, but also about the world. So I'm going to help you think about the world uh, in uh, preparation of that time. Now for me personally, I work six days a week, always work six days a week. And um, in my younger days, I devoted six days a week to healthcare, the healthcare industry. I studied chemistry as an undergraduate, went to business school, uh, and I always loved healthcare because healthcare, we save people's lives. And you make money. It's like uh, it, both. And in America. What? In America, you make money. Here, here you go. Right. Well, uh, I look at it from the pharmaceutical point of view, the medical device point of view, and the service point of view. Mm -hmm. So in the service point of view, in Israel, you do not make so much money. But in the pharmaceutical or, or the medical device, a manufacturer point of view, they, they make uh, plenty of money. And, um, and um, so I studied healthcare, and um, I worked on Wall Street, and I advised investors as to what stocks they should buy in the healthcare field. And then when 9-11 uh, happened, uh, almost 25 years ago, I decided to spend one day a week on national security. Nobody asked me, nobody cared, but I cared. And I knew there was something major wrong. We all knew, uh, some of you were not old enough at that time, but we all knew that uh, something was wrong and I decided to learn what was wrong because I was listening on television and there were different analysts, people like me, but people specialists in national security or specialists in uh, Islam or whatever subject, uh, China, and, and I did not like their analysis. So I said to myself, I can do a better job because I'm a professional analyst, that's what I do. But I focus on healthcare and, and making money and helping people make money. But I took one day a week and devoted it to national security. Then after a few years, I started writing uh, one-page um, think pieces on certain subjects. Then it became two pages, you know, back and forth. 
a duplex, as we say. And then about uh, 10 years ago, I set up a website called savethewest.com. Everybody should sign up uh, for savethewest.com. And um, I started writing articles every two weeks. I wrote an article. And then two years ago, I wrote a book called The Multi-Front War, which I'm going to show you. How do you fight 100 wars at the same time, or challenges, or issues, or problems? Uh, and I wrote a book. Uh, and I give, for the last six years, 100 speeches a year as a public service on how to save Western civilization. So I now spend three days a week on what I call public service, three days a week on my job, healthcare analysis and money management. So I have an expression about myself. I try to make more money during the three days that I work than I lose during my three days of public service. I lose money on every single thing I do. Every article I write, I lose money or, or time. Uh, every speech I give, I lose money or time. And I do it gladly because I'm trying to help people understand what it took me 20 years to understand, uh, namely how to save Western civilization or how to save good from evil. And one of my big helpers is, is, is the Torah because the Torah is nonstop good and evil. And it's right there in front of your face. All you have to do is read it. So as I read the Torah week after week after week, it, it, it's, it becomes cumulative. When I uh, first started reading the Torah, I thought it was like a history lesson. You know, 3,300 years, this good person or a bad person did this or that to someone else. And, uh, but now I've realized that the challenges of the Torah and the dilemmas and the issues is still with us today. And I'm going to explain to you the relationship between ancient history Torah, which is actually reality today, now, also, in the Torah, there's an expression that the Torah does not have an extra word in it. So when I wrote my book, I purposely try to take out every extra word. And when I give speeches, I try not to insert extra words. I just try to say, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's the problem, here's the solution. Now, one last thing about myself. I give 100 speeches a year. The average speech is 10 minutes because I, have, I give many two-minute and five-minute speeches to senators, congressmen, governors, attorney generals, and in Israel, Knesset members and ministers, and they might only give me 10 minutes. So I give them an hour speech, but I put it in 10 minutes. So, but today, since we have time, I'm going to give you uh, not only a speech, but also a discussion or a seminar, uh, but it's, uh, will be maybe uh, half an hour or 45 minutes, but I, I can do it in, in uh, and I've done it in um, five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, and one minute. So I gave President Trump a one-minute speech because that's, that's all I got. So I learned how to do that. And I'll tell you that story later if you're interested. So let's go to now. Uh, before I start, I should also mention uh, I studied chemistry, as I said, and I went to business school. And... Uh, uh, who, uh, just for my curiosity, who here is studying a science? You know, you divide the world into science and non-science, basically. So who, who's studying a science? Uh, I studied in my first degree. Yeah, okay, first degree. I'm talking about first degree. Science, anybody? Political science, is it the science? No. <laughs> okay, so no. I studied no. engineering. Engineering. Oh, you're so professional, well done. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about a first degree. Now, uh, let me define science. I mean, we're talking about uh, math. Um, uh, physics, uh, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, economics, I would put in the science category. Anything that has numbers. Uh, so economics? Yeah, right. You know, because with numbers, we have an expression in America, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Do you know that, 2 plus 2 equals 4? But in the humanities, sociology, English, Hebrew, literature, 2 plus 2 equals whatever the professor thinks it is. Okay? So... <laughs> that's right. Everything is what you decided. That's right. That, that's right. So, so then, who, who's studying a science? Now, let's everyone raise their hand, including Eka. So, it, it's almost half, which is typical, by the way. Every university is split between science and non science. So, um, 
So all I can say is if you can study a science, study a science. But if you, um, one of the things about a science is when you study chemistry uh, at a young, at, in college um, versus history, um, you're not going to have a chance to study chemistry again. I mean, unless you go further degrees in chemistry. Now in history, uh, anybody, a, ch a chemistry major like me, can pick up a history book and read it and, and understand it like right away. But a history major cannot pick up a chemistry book 10 years from today and read it and understand anything. So in general, it's best to study science as an undergraduate. And, but if you do study um, the social sciences or the humanities, that's where you're most at risk to evil. Because depending on the university, somewhere between 70 and 90% of the professors are evil. Not, for, only, for, not only because of the grades. Not yeah. So therefore, you, you have to play along, so to speak. In other words, if you have an evil professor and they tell you to do something evil, it, but if you do it, you get an A. Or, we use ABCs. Do you use ABCs for grades? We use 10. 10. Okay. Okay. So you get a 10 if, if you do something. Um, I, I always tell uh, people if that, you, you have to be, develop two personalities. One, a good personality, which you have, and then you temporarily become evil, so you get a 10 in this course that you're studying. So I never tell anybody to uh, hurt themselves in university um, for, on principle. You can uh, worry about principle when you get older, but the system is stacked against you in the humanities, and so you just have to play along with the system. But not in science, because as I said, in science, two plus two is four. The professor, even the, uh, a lunatic professor, is not going to tell you it's five. Um, so that's just... Uh, so let's now go to work. We're going to discuss. Okay. Now I color code good and evil to make it easy. By the way, when you when you go see see a football game, your your favorite team, let's just say, is blue, and the other team is red. So in one second, you understand good and evil, okay? So uh, I'm gonna help you understand good and evil in the real world. Now, uh, in the real world, people do not walk around with shirts that say good or evil. And, uh, and, and uh, I characterize the forces of evil, which I'm gonna define for you, the reds, the greens, and the blues, Again, they do not walk around with a, a t-shirt that says I'm red, I'm green, or I'm blue. So everybody pretends that they're normal, so you, but half the people are not normal. So I want to help you understand when someone who pretends that they're normal is not normal. And again, I'll go back to what I said before, but remember they lie. That people who are not normal lie 100% of the time. So it gets extra difficult to identify the people who are evil because nobody stands up and says, I'm evil. No one stands up and says, I believe in the Ten Commandments, but I took one, letter, one word out of each of the ten, and, but I'm normal. Uh, and no one says, I believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the population, but I'm normal. So remember, the forces of evil have to lie. They have no choice but to lie. And they're very good at lying. So you have to identify when people lie. So I'm going to help you identify when people lie. Okay, so who are the reds and who are the greens and who are the blues? The reds are the communists, the greens are the Islamists, the blues are the globalists. Now, when I say reds, that's the tr a traditional color for communists. And so in terms of countries, it would be Russia, China, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, among others. They're all dictatorships. 
or life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the population. And they, they all want to take over the world, either their region or their world, depending upon who they are. Yeah. Now, Russia is not a communist country, but it, it was. Yeah. So um, it, it's just an autocracy or dictatorship, but no, no one believes in communism anymore. But it was founded in 1917 based on communism when the Lenin and his fellow criminals illegally took over the government through a coup. Okay, so um, uh, China was formed in 1949. Um, it wasn't a coup, but uh, Mao Zedong and his followers won the war, so they, there was a civil war and they won. So uh, the Red War has been going on since 1917. Uh, if you want, uh, Karl Marx, uh, the, the intellectual Jewish thinker of this nonsense, uh, was living in the uh, writing in the 1830s, 1840s. So you could say that the Red War began with Karl Marx. But I, I use 1917 as the beginning of the Red War. The Green War, which today, it's not Muslims, it's Islamists. Everyone know the difference between Muslims and Islamists? Islam is a 50% religion and a 50% political movement. So if someone says, I'm Muslim, I believe in the religion, well, we all have freedom of religion. Every democracy has freedom of religion. But if someone says, I'm an Islamist, and I believe in Islam, the religion, but I believe in imposing it on everybody else, then you're an Islamist, okay, which is illegal. By the way, you can, can you imagine that you're having lunch in the cafeteria and there's some Christians there? So you walk over the Christians and say, you know, you really should be Jewish. I'm going to explain everything about the Torah in 30 seconds. And then I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about it. And if you do not become Jewish in 60 seconds, I'm going to kill you. Okay? Right to jail. Right to jail. Okay? That, that would be political Judaism. Okay? We don't, we don't have that. Okay? Now, by the way, 500 years ago, there was political Christianity. The Inquisition. In the... Uh, 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 14 and 1500s. The Catholics in Spain said, you will become Catholic or I'm going to kill you or deport you. Okay, but uh, they grew out of that. So the, uh, who are the Islamist countries of today? It would be Iran on the Shiite side. And on the Sunni side it would be Qatar and Turkey who are financing the Muslim Brotherhood, which you call Hamas here. So those are the Islamist countries. They're building mosques all over the place. They're building schools all over the place. I call them cultural terrorists. I mean, there's physical terrorists, like with the knife. But if you build a school and you teach the false narrative that all the children, when they get older, have to kill everybody who's not Shiite or not Sunni Muslim, I call that a false narrative. That's political Islam. Should be illegal. This war began 1,400 years ago when Muhammad and his followers illegally invaded 55 Christian countries, mostly Christian countries, in one Jewish country, and took them over against their will and forced everybody to convert to Islam or killed them or deported them. So that war has been going on for 1,400 years. The blue war is blue, I color coded for the United Nations. If you look at a United Nations soldier, he has a, like a blue helmet. Uh, so this is my code name for globalists. So it includes also the, uh, the World Economic Forum, includes the drug cartels, and includes businesses that act in a global manner like social media companies. This war began in 1923 with the League of Nations and then became the United Nations and then now the World Economic Forum. These are globalists. They do not care about individual countries. They want to take over individual countries and rule them from the world, whereas uh, I believe uh, that every individual country has the right to be an individual country and does not have to listen to someone who says, I'm the leader of the world and I'm going to tell you what to do. In, in our American Constitution, it says that the president is commander-in-chief. It does not say commander-in-chief if the United Nations agrees with him or commander-in-chief if the World Economic Forum agrees with him. No, he's the commander-in-chief. 
every, not every country uses the term commander in chief, but everybody has somebody who is the equivalent of commander in chief. And so I believe in individual countries and I believe in uh, individual governments to run those individual countries. And I do not believe in worldwide organizations. So this war began in 1923. So that's why I say it's actually World War I. Because the wars began 100 years, 1400 years, and 100 years ago. They predated World War I and World War II. But somebody already numbered World War I and II, uh, so I have no choice but to call it World War III. Now, let me give you one more history lesson. Uh, if you go back 3,350 years, approximately, to the story of the golden calf. Everyone remember the golden calf? Golden calf? All right, so I'll remind everybody of the golden calf. So uh, Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments for 40 days. He comes down one day late. So the people were worried. Maybe something happened to Moshe our leader, maybe we need a new leader, uh, maybe God's not really there on Mount Sinai, maybe, maybe we, we do not have the Ten Commandments. So chaos created, was created, uh, people put their gold together, and, and uh, as, as uh, Moshe's uh, brother Aaron said, uh, when Moshe said, how did this happen? He says, well, we just took this gold, we threw it into the oven, and it came out, and all of a sudden there was a golden calf. It just sort of like came out, came out of the oven. <laughs> so, was, um, so what did the golden calf insurrectionists want? By the way, when Moshe came down and saw the insurrection, he asked for help from the 12 tribes. One of the 12 tribes, the Levites, came as volunteers to help, and in those days, they had swords. <laughs> and, and Moshe says, kill the insurrectionists. And 3,000 people were dead. We do not have Moshe at Rabbeinu anymore. We do not have, we have Levites, but not with swords. And we did not kill 3,000 people during an insurrection. But this was biblical times, and that, that's what they did. So, it, I mean, today, if it happened, the Levites would be in jail. And, and Moshe at Rabbeinu would be in jail. You know, everything's being reversed now. But... Uh, so what did the insurrectionists not want? They, there's three things that they rejected. They rejected Moshe as the leader. In today's term, it would be Trump in America or Netanyahu in Israel. Not that they're Moshe Rabbeinu. They're just the best we can do. I, I have a scale of one to 100. Moshe Rabbeinu is 99. That's like the best a human being can do, he's 99. Uh, our leaders, uh, even our great leaders, are 50 or 60 or maybe Winston Churchill, maybe 70, uh, Ben-Gurion. Uh, but uh, in general, our leaders, are, um, I rate them like a 50 or 60 or so. But anyways, that's the best we can do. We, we, we don't have a choice of Netanyahu or Moshe Rabbeinu. You know? like we call the Iftah in his generation, is like yeah. Moshe in his yeah. generation. Yeah, right, right. Generous. Right. So... Um, so they wanted three things. They wanted to replace Moshe with a new leader, not to find, but a new leader. They wanted to replace the rule of law, the Ten Commandments, which then became the Torah uh, as it expanded. And they rejected Hashem. When you look at the forces of evil today, the reds, the greens, and the blues, they are the golden calf. They just change colors. They still believe in what the golden calf believed, golden calf insurrectionists believed. But instead of being yellow, obviously, for the color of gold, they changed. So you could look at it as the golden calf of today is one-third red, one-third green, one-third blue. Or you could say there's three little baby golden calves. One's red, one's green, one's blue, and they happen to be, they travel together in the same herd, as we say in America. So I would argue that World War III is World War I because we're fighting the same war as the golden calf from the Torah. Nothing's changed. 3,350 years later. But again, I call it World War III because I, I have to. But I just want you to understand, there's no such thing that when you look at war and peace, it's 100% war 100% of the time. There's no such thing as peace. There's always a battle between good and evil. Sometimes it's a physical battle and, and bombs blow up. 
generally it's more of a cultural battle where people yell, talk to each other, or yell at each other. So I call that cultural warfare. But just think to yourselves that uh, it's 100% war forever in the future and in the past. That's what human beings do. Sometimes I have a joke to, to myself that I, I get on an airplane and, and I go to the jungle of Africa and I, I meet a, a zebra and pretend the zebras speak English. And I say, Mr. Zebra, is it wartime or peacetime in the jungle or in the savanna or where, wherever they're living? And, and the zebra looks at me and he says, you flew all the way from Florida to ask me a question that stupid? He says, I live in the jungle or in, in Africa where I, I'm always trying to eat somebody and somebody's trying to eat me. It's, it's always warfare in the jungle. How could you, be so, how could you humans be so stupid? Uh, so we're, we're just glorified animals and, and we're, we're fighting. We don't eat each other. You know, at least we, we progressed from that. But, but we're always fighting each other. Uh, ever since Cain and Abel. You could say World War I began with Cain and Abel. You, you, uh, but I, uh, I use the golden calf as the beginning of World War I. But the, the Tower of Babel, you can, there's many other um, stories or history stories that you can use. Now, why do the reds, the greens, and the blues, why have they declared war on the people who are good? Which I'm going to define the yellows and the whites. Well, the yellows and whites are good, and I'll explain why. I already explained in the beginning, uh, Ten Commandments plus life, living, pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people, and that's the yellows. So the yellows would say, I believe in life, living, pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people in the world, in the world. The whites, who are also good people, I color code them white for the surrender flag, they would say they believe in life, living, pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people in Israel, or in America, or in France but not in the world. So that's, that, they basically do not want to fight, is basically the issue. So they're, they're still good people. There can be good people who want to fight and good people who do not want to fight. So the whites are good people who do not want to fight. So why have the reds, the greens, and the blues declared war on the yellows and whites? What did, what did we do to deserve this? Well, the, the answer is the forces of evil uh, and good, when you put them together in a, in a box, so to speak, it's, it's guaranteed war because the forces of evil cannot tolerate the forces of good. Because the forces of evil are, are criminals. So, and they're stealing all the money from their societies. So if the people can see that uh, if you had two countries side by side and you had an evil country and a good country and you just look you know, into the horizon, not very far, you just go to a mountain and you look, and you say, oh, that country believes in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people. They actually care about their people. And the government does, and the government collects taxes, but the government's not stealing money, and the leaders are not stealing money. And, and so the criminals say, well, what happens if my population realizes they do not have to live under my dictatorship? What if they realize they have an alternative and they can live in a functioning democracy and live like human beings and, and, and progress like human beings. And um, it'll hurt my ability to be a dictator, right? So that's why the dictators have to destroy the democracies. The democracies do not have to destroy the dictatorships. When we wake up in the morning, what do we say to each other or to ourselves? We say, I'm going to wake up today. I'm going to go to school or I'm going to go to my job. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to pay for my apartment. I'm going to create a family and then a bigger family. I'm going to go on vacation. And I hope to go to the theater uh, next week. That's what, or vacation. That's what, whereas the evil people say when they wake up, they say, I'm, I'm evil. And wh what good people can I destroy? What good countries can I destroy? Uh, what land can I steal? What houses can I steal? Uh, can, can I get away with it uh, uh, without getting killed myself? So uh, good and, and evil think differently from each other, and they don't coexist happily. So that's why the bad guys declare war on the good guys. We, the good guys do not declare war on the bad guys. The only time the good guys declare war on the bad guys is when there's something like 9-11 where they uh, can, cannot um, do nothing. 
or a terrorist incident where, where the good guys have to respond. Um, uh, and that's, uh, whereas um, I think the good guys should understand they're in a state of war every single day and not wait for someone to get killed to behave t in a tough manner. Okay. By the way, in a perfect world, the yellows would be 90% of this page. Right now, it's about a third of the page. So it's a pretty sad situation that the forces of good are one third, and we're surrounded by evil. OK. So now, let's flip it over. Flip over the page. Now, I'm going to show you that we're actually fighting 90 wars at the same time, 9-0, which I call a multi-front war. And I wrote a book about this. How do you do, can you do 90 things at the same time? Anyone here know how, how to do 90 things? So it, I'm going to give you the quick answer. It only can be done as a team. For example, if you, if you play basketball or football, any of the sports, you'll, you'll see a real team. Now, on a team, there's always the greatest player. Well, you take the team away, just put the greatest player there, the greatest basketball player, the greatest football player, doesn't matter. In America, the greatest baseball player, and none of the rest of the team, and have that individual compete against the other team, they'll lose 100% of the time, by definition. Right? So the answer is, this is a team sport. It's not in, I mean, we're all important as individuals, but it, we're playing a team sport. And only a team can manage the challenges of, of 90 wars at the same time. So whenever uh, someone says someone's a great leader, okay, whoever it is, I say to myself, that's wonderful. That's like the equivalent of a great basketball star. I want to see the team. Only if that great leader has a team around him, her, can they manage the 90 challenges at the same time. So I, I tell, I have a little analogy in America. Uh, does, uh, does anyone know what a wiffle ball is? Wiffle ball? No. So a wiffle ball is a plastic ball. And uh, so you can throw it to, you know, like kids, th throw, catch with each other. And uh, every American has a, every American five-year-old has a wiffle ball. And when their friends come over, they, th they play catch with each other. So, um, so when I talk to senators or congressmen or the equivalent in, in America, I say, pretend you, you just won the election. You're walking into the Knesset or into the, the state, the capital, as we call it. And your friends and enemies have wiffle balls. They throw 90 wiffle balls up in the air. And they say, new senator, catch. New prime minister, catch. What's going to happen? You'll fail, by definition. Okay? You'll catch two of them, one with each hand. You know, they're plastic. It's, it's, it's easy to catch. Uh, but you cannot catch the other 88. But if you have a team of 10 people, or call them staff members, or cabinet members, and, and then they walk into the chamber, and then there's 90 wiffle balls in the air, then the cabinet, the staff, collectively can handle the 90 issues. So it, one of the big deficiencies in democracies is I see great leaders, but I do not see, see great staffs. So when I see the people surrounding our Trump or surrounding Netanyahu <coughs> and uh, surrounding our great leaders, I do not see 10 or 20 equally smart, equally capable, equally hardworking staff people and cabinet members who uh, can complement that. Um, so that's one of the challenges that I uh, identified in my book. Now, let's look at the first column. I disaggregated, in other words, I separated <coughs> the reds, the greens, and the blues into 17 separate criminal organizations. Remember, when I went through reds, greens, and blues, I was talking in generalities, you know, China or Russia, you know. So now, it, 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 it's, it's in English. It might take you a little extra time to read. But when you go down the list, and, and it's purposely not in any order, because I didn't want people to think that there's an e easy solution here. In other words, you identify one bad guy, and you make them number one, and you say, oh, I'm going to solve number one, and forget about another 16. No. So I wanted people to understand that you have to identify all the 17 criminal organizations and come up with strategies to defeat the 17 criminal organizations, because I'm going to give you a hint. 
the 17 criminal organizations have a strategy to destroy you, to destroy the forces of good. They play offense 100% of the time. The forces of good play defense 100% of the time. I just, I just want life to be like a football game. You know, a football game is like 50% offense, 50% defense, okay? But you cannot have a society or a political organization that says, I play defense 100% of the time. When you're competing against someone who plays offense 100% of the time, you're going to lose. So, um, so I took many different types of organizations. Some are countries. Some are just organizations or businesses. And uh, some of them are newspapers. Some of them are social media. Um, some of them could be what we call think tanks. Uh, that would be like uh, a group of people who write articles and books, uh, for maybe former professors or something like that. Now, these bad guys use six forms of warfare against us. Six forms. Now, when you say to someone, what's the definition of war? They said, oh, they would say, oh, I just saw a movie from World War II, and there were bombs and, 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 and smoke and fire. OK, that's physical war. That's one form of warfare. It's called either physical war, or in America, we have a term called kinetic, when, when, when a bullet is, or artillery is doing something. Uh, I also include COVID here, COVID. COVID was biological warfare by China against the world, and in particular against America. There's cultural warfare. That's, that's what we, that I tell soldiers, uh, when they have a uniform on, they're a physical warrior. When they take the uniform on, off and they look like us, then they're a cultural warrior. See? So they're fighting with words. Okay? And then we have a economic war. That's your fighting boycotts. BDS is economic warfare. Anti-Semitism, BDS warfare against Jews. Legal warfare, it's also known as lawfare. You, you, some a bad guy sues a good guy, and, and which forces, which is a lot of money and a lot of time in court. Then there's demographic warfare, when uh, Israel did not have a border with Sinai, and the Muslim Brotherhood recruited almost 100,000 Muslims to invade Israel. That was demographic warfare by the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, against Israel. In America, we have the same thing going on. Uh, our southern border is open, but our federal government has let it be open, and that's demographic warfare by the federal government of America against the American people. It's, it's hard to explain why that happens. It's a long story. I'll explain it later. And cyber, obviously. So when you multiply 17 bad guys by six forms of warfare, it comes out to about 102. But not every bad guy uses every form of warfare. So when I uh, mix and match, it comes out to about 90 different wars. We can call them challenges or issues or dilemmas. And our democracies are not capable of handling 90 issues at the same time. You think judicial reform is a big issue. It is a big issue. OK, there's another 89 issues. OK, you're, you're the prime minister. You want to you manage 90, 90 issues? Or you're the president of the United States? So you see, what it's, a, it's a managerial nightmare. Now, in corporations, I come from the corporate world. So um, take Johnson & Johnson, largest healthcare company in the world. If I went to meet the president, just pretend, and I said, Mr. President, I've analyzed your com company, and I think you have 90 challenges. He would probably laugh, and he would say, I have a thanks for telling me I have 90 challenges. I have 1,000 challenges. I have 250 within Johnson Johnson. There's 250 separate companies. And just pretend that each company has four problems. And he would say to me, I, I have 250 companies within Johnson Johnson. I have 1,000 problems. So your, your, two, your estimate of 90 problems is, is too low. I have 1,000. So I would say to him, but Mr. President, how do you manage 1,000 things at the same time? He says, my company has 135,000 employees. I'm not, I'm not, it's not a one-man show. OK, under me, there's a number two, there's number three, number four, number five. And there's a president for each of the 250 divisions. They report to um, group uh, uh, managers. And then they report up to me. So because of my team, going back to my analogy with 
uh, football or basketball, because in my team, I can manage a thousand challenges. But do not ask me as an individual to manage a thousand. But in the corp, so what I'm saying is every corporation has a thousand or a hundred or ninety, whatever it is, challenges. But the corporation is structured to manage its way through that. But when I take my corporate glasses off and I put my political glasses off and I go to Jerusalem or, or Washington, it, it, I, and I see that they cannot even manage one issue, let alone 90, I get worried. I get worried just as an individual citizen. And that's my key motivator, is to help our political leaders understand that they have to manage their democracy more like a corporation than as a traditional democracy, because uh, a, a democracy is just committee after committee after committee after committee, and you can't manage 90 issues with 90 committees. You'll never make any decisions. So that, that um, is what I wanted to describe to you. And I wanted to leave you with one happy word, because sometimes people accuse me of uh, giving discussions that are not so happy. So I'm going to leave you with a happy, happy word. There's a famous movie in America, but not in Israel, called Network. Does anyone, uh, it, it was also 40 years ago. Probably no, no one here is old enough to have seen that. But when you go home, you know, go to Netflix or whatever you use here to uh, look at the movie called Network. So this was about an announcer uh, who was working for this television network. And he was always fighting with the people above him because he, he, he said things, you know, on television, you're supposed to say things like this. And he, and he was say, saying many, many controversial things. So the, 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 the bosses did not like what he said. So one day he was very, very upset. And, and he was living in uh, New York City in Manhattan. And he opens up his window. Now in, in New York, when you open your window and you say something, no one, no one can hear you. Okay, it's, a, it's like in Tel Aviv, who's, who's going to hear you? Uh, but it's a comedy, so, so they, they, they pretended that people could hear. So he opens up his window, and I'm going to say it exactly like an actor, okay? He, he opens up his window, and he says, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. It's a very famous line yeah. in America. Okay, so the only way this nonsense will end is when we become as mad as hell and not take it anymore. And, and it has to energize us to get off of our seats and, and, and uh, participate in particularly the cultural war, where when we do not have uniforms, we do not have guns, but we're arguing and discussing, and we have to learn how to be better, better and better at arguing, arguing with the forces of evil, or the golden calf, or the reds, the greens, and the blues. So I just want to tell that that's a happy note. On a happy note, we all have to think about opening the equivalent of the window and, and energizing ourselves for the cultural work. So thank you for your time. Yes. I'd like to begin with uh, just explaining what I'm trying to do. Uh, the thing is, I generally learn by like, challenging what they hear, so don't take it as, like, <laughs> as something bad. I'm just wanting, trying to like, challenge a bit of things. Uh, oh. saying a little bit the Let me give you one more definition of good, which I forgot to give you. Anyone who agrees with me. <laughs> that's, that's, yes, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Red, yes. Same okay. <laughs> All right. So now I'm worried. I'm worried. So, so what I'm going to say is, I completely agree with your. What, with, weirdly enough, I completely agree with your conclusion, but I don't really agree with the steps you take to agree. So I wanted to challenge you a little bit, especially on two uh, two fronts. The first thing, the first thing is, um, a lot of what you say is based on the beginning f uh, from the Bible, right? You say. This is a story about the golden calf, or the story about the kind of heaven or something. And so, as a person who defines himself as an atheist, I it's it's quite hard for me to like to, to to connect to this thing. So I think it's not it's interesting that you choose to do it for a few reasons. First of all, strategically, 
people like me would find it a bit harder to connect when you base it on like basic definitions of good and evil and stuff like the Bible or that are not widely accepted. But second of all, I think it's just you just miss a bit the definition of good evil and evil by doing this. Because even if you take the Ten Commandments, like I think most people would agree that this is not like a good definition of good and evil. Why? Because First of all, it doesn't catch all the good things. Like we agree that someone who is an atheist who doesn't believe in the commandment of say say you don't take uh, one god, in vain, yeah. in vain or right. like that. Yeah. But they still can be a very good person, right. while, uh, 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 while a very religious person can be uh, can be evil. Yeah. On the other hand, you don't really you, you don't catch all the good people, and also you don't like define it correctly because again you have definitions that do not really fit. So I think that. I wanted to, to hear what you could say about that. No, no, that's very reasonable. Now, bear in mind, I told you my average speech is more like 10 minutes. When you speak to a senator or a minister of the government, uh, or President Trump or Prime Minister Netanyahu, when you only have 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or 2 minutes, everything's black and white. You do not have time to talk about gray, as we say in America. Uh, so, uh, so that's why uh, uh, my, my speeches are, are always black, black and white, so to speak. But yes, life is not as simple as black and white. Or, but I try to pretend that it is, because otherwise I'd, I'd be speaking too long. You'd all be sleeping, so to speak. You know what I mean? So no, but your, your points are, are well taken. Now once, someone said to me, they, raised hand, they said, uh, I'm an atheist. They said to me, can I still be yellow? You know, can I still be good? And so I said to that person, so I'll say it to you, do you have a conscience? Yeah. And she, she said, yes. I mean, do you understand the difference between good and evil? I mean, are you going to take a, 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 a hammer and, and hit someone on the head? No, it, you, you do not have to read the Ten Commandments. You just know that that's, that's good people do not take a hammer and hit somebody else. Okay, because they have rights. You have rights. They have rights. So, um, so I'll say, do you have a conscience? And you said yes. And, and that woman said yes. And I say, close it up. Your congratulations. You're yellow. But I would say that most people, uh, even most people who are so-called evil, won't take a hammer and hit someone randomly on the head, and will consider themselves of having a conscience. So that's kind of conflict. Maybe they will uh, lack uh, research. Uh, Places because they don't agree with the, the policy or something like this. But, but most people don't wake up in the morning and they go and yeah. yeah, no, I'm no, evil. But, but I think that yeah. ma many what, what you call evil people are uh, able to do very bad things uh, because of their ideology. And this is what makes them very bad people because they say, like you see, the protesters. The anarchists right now in Tel Aviv, they say, okay, we don't agree uh, uh, ideology uh, uh, with what the, the government is doing, so we are willing to do very bad things uh, to, uh, to flame and, and to burn all of the streets and to harm people and to, to do, uh, to, to even, you know, uh, use some kind of violence, because we think it's, it's, the, it's the right way and uh, it's... It, you can see how you can really uh, things really can can be escalated to uh, to violence in this kind of in this way of thinking. Now let me add something. When I say reds, the greens, and the blues, separate ten percent and ninety percent. Ten percent of the reds, the greens, and the blues are pure evil. No. Putin attacking Ukraine. Okay, killing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Obviously, in history, uh, Hitler. Okay, pure evil. That's the ten percent. The leadership, very very smart. Uh, the supreme leader of Iran, very very smart people. Pure evil. Then there's the other ninety percent. Lenin had an expression. He called them useful idiots. How do you say useful idiot in Hebrew? Yeah. Okay. So. Ni 90% of the reds, the greens, and the blues are actually not reds, greens, and blues. But they've been brainwashed, either as a child or a, as an adult, into this false narrative. Again, remember the reds, greens, and blues lie 100% of the time. So they listen to the lies over and over and over again, and then they think they're red, or they think they're green, or they think they're blue. But actually, it's only 10%. The other 90% are being used and manipulated. And... Um, 
and can be saved, can be re-educated. Um, the trouble is it's very time consuming. If I went to every single protester on the ILN highway who was blocking traffic, and they said, oh, excuse me, I just came from Florida, and I'm going to talk with each of you for half an hour and explain to you why you're a useful idiot and being manipulated by people who are actually very evil. So let me explain that to you. How, how, who's, who's listening to me, right? So it's very difficult to, to communicate because the uh, I have an expression, someone who's been brainwashed for 22 years, I cannot fix that in 20 minutes. It's, it's not enough time in the day for me to fix that, that uh, brainwashing. Now, I'll give you a little joke about um, three or four years ago, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, the equivalent of the uh, head of the Knesset, that, uh, um, that'd be Omer Ohana today. Yeah, but uh, he, she was the Speaker of the House. She publicly said this that half of the people in America must go to re-education camps. You know what a re-education yeah, camp? Yeah, yeah. That is, I do not like the way you think, and so um, the, the Chinese used to. Yeah. Right. right. So I, I, I listened to her. She said it seriously. And then I created a joke. I said, this is the first time I agree with Nancy Pelosi. She is right. Half of the people need to be in a re-education. It's just not the half she thinks. See? So, and I said to myself, and I will manage the re-education camp. The question is, how many years would the half the people have to be in the re-education camp for me and my staff to re-educate them? You, you can see if you've been brainwashed for 20 years, it could take 20 years to fix you, so to speak. So um, it's, it's a huge problem that we have in every society. Now, we actually do have re-education camps in Israel. You do not know this. In America and Israel, we have re-education camps. That's very good. That's very good. They're uni called universities. And that's why I first started out by trying to say to you that if you're uh, in the sciences, you're safe. But if you're not in the, in the sciences, you're, you're, um, you're in a re-education camp. And so therefore, you have to become two personalities, the good person that you really are, and then when the evil professor tells you to write something stupid, write something stupid, and you get your 10, and get your, finish your, your university and go on to your next school or, or whatever you do. So you, it's a sad situation that you have to play this game, but you, you, you're not strong enough to stop the game. You, you Actually, cannot... I, I must say, I'm sorry I'm interrupting, yeah. that yesterday we had another lecture of Israeli doctor, Gadi Tau, He's a doctor, a, a yeah, he, here. Yeah, he's on TV, he's good. So, yeah, yeah, and he's very famous, and he said actually exactly what you said, what you are saying now, that he is recommending to students here in Israel to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be like two persons, like you said, and to, to, uh, to be an imposter in right. front of the lecturers to write down what they want and uh, to get uh, your A and your grades. And right. To, to, uh, to remind yourself all the way who, who you really are and what you really believe in. Right. And, uh, right. The best advice I ever heard was finish your university, get rich, <laughs> give a lot of money to the university, and then tell them you're going to pull the money. <laughs> That's right. That's a lot of time. This is why Richard is trying to uh, also fight the uh, main life. Yes. So actually, I wanted to ask something else. Okay. We have a time. Yeah, yeah, last question. Yeah, yeah. So about the, what, about your answer to Nancy Pelosi. So what you said is, yeah, I agree. I think that 50% of the discussion actually need to go to, to camps. But for me, it seems kind of dangerous because when you're trying to say, when you're going and saying about 50% of the population, you need to be ready to re educated and they're brainwashed and stuff like that. And when I look at some of the organizations you wrote here, like CNN, like it seems to me that the line you draw between people who you call enemies and the line you between people who you call enemies and people who call, you call like political disagreement or well, you call, useful like, idiots. Yeah. It's not exactly even useful idiots because you do have to respect the fact that there are different opinions. Like yeah. who are the people who are going to say, well, I don't agree with them, but they don't need to go through re-education. We just it's like a healthy disagreement I have with them. And the thing is that if you say fifty percent of the population are, are useful idiots, then the other side is going to say the same thing about you, right? Because that's the other side thinks about others that are that, that's right. useful idiots. Right. This means that what you actually are creating is a war. Every time they're in control and in power, they're going to re-educate us, and every time we're in control and in power, we're going to re-educate them. 
Isn't the right team going to say 80% of the people are useful idiots on both sides? We agree on ba most basic moral things. We need to reject the 10% of, of, of extremists on this side and 10% of, of extremists on that side. And this is how we, we create a good society and functional society that does not have an internal civil war all the time. It seems to me that this is like the more, the, the more uh, not dangerous way of looking at things. Well, look, look let, me, let me give you an analogy. When you go see a football game, or boxing, boxing. And uh, everyone knows the rules. This boxer, that boxer, the, the referee knows the rules. The coaches know the every. So you're playing according to the same rule book. Therefore, you can have a fair fight. But what if one of the boxers says, I do not care, I do not care about the rules, and I'm going to kick you? And you say, no, no, Mr. Boxer, you did not understand. I read the, the book. In, in chapter 14, uh, paragraph 7, it says you have to box, but you cannot kick somebody. And, and the other boxer says, but I want to win at all costs. I do not care about the rule book. I just want to win. Then you cannot have boxing anymore. See what I mean? So in politics, it's somewhat similar. So when you have a party or a coalition of parties that says, I believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the people. And another party says, I believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the people. You cannot have a fair fight between those two uh, parties because you, you're not agreeing to the same rules. See? And so... So should we also break the rules? No. No. But you're supposed to have one rule of law for everybody. And Israel's lost that. And by the way, America's lost that. And most democracies have lost that. Because what happens is each year you go from your founding, whether it's Torah founding or 1948 or in America, 1776. Each generation gets miseducated a little bit. And then you go 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 generations later, and you can see what the problem is. People forget about the wisdom of 1776 or the wisdom of the Torah. And, and, and so every society ha has going through a civil war. Fortunately, we're not killing each other. But uh, Israel and America are both going through a civil war. And, and I try to help the good guys. And that's uh, the job that I uh, nominated for myself. So thank you, for everybody, for your time. Yeah. It's only it's very important. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for dedicating your time like, okay. to come and speak with us. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, also, it's, it is very inspiring um, for us because we face evil powers here in campus on a daily basis, and this is just a reminder, like Shai said before, to zoom out and realize what are we fighting against. Um, so thank you so much. This okay. is from us. Great. Thank you. And, and, and I have one question for you. Yeah. Here's a test. Are you as mad as hell? Oh, I forgot the, <laughs> I forgot the end to oh, you. are not going to take it anymore? <laughs> we My need memories. a tambore. <laughs> so we let's have do a picture, picture of two. Okay. With the, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Shemtalen, Tomer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.